So I'm here to talk about uh, Dickinson manuscripts at the Historical Society of Pennsylvania. Um, so um, I've been working in the collections for 20 years and uh, I love being there. It's, it's just one of my favorite places in the world. And um, so I'm, I'm, I'm really excited to get to tell you about, about these amazing collections. And I think probably unlike most researchers, I have, um, I've had the opportunity to actually reprocess some of the collections and help write some of the finding aids for those collections because uh, Dickinson experts are, well, I, I'm the only one. So, um, so, so I, I, I wanted to, to try to help out. There's a lot more to do, but um, hopefully um, uh, that'll come through today and you'll understand um, why I'm so excited about, about these collections and what still needs to be done. Um, so, um, so, so John Dickinson, uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit about him because like most people, um, you probably don't know very much. Uh, you might have, you might have heard him referred to as the Pennsylvania farmer. I'll, I'll explain that as we go along. Um, but, but basically sort of in a nutshell, um, Dickinson was, um, really the most prolific of the founders. He, um, he, he published more on public affairs over the course of his life than any other major figure. He also held, I think he held more uh, public offices than any other major figure as well. And so here, uh, what, I've, what I'm showing you right here is just the major things, um, just the best known of his writings and the offices that he held. This is by, by no stretch uh, <laughs> uh, complete. Um, I, I think I once estimated that he had maybe somewhere around 800 public writings um, that, that, that he, he did. So, um, uh, so these are just the major ones. And, um, and, and here in red are the items that the HSP has either um, full drafts or partial drafts or notes of. So, you know, just, just scratching the surface here, you can see the HSP is, is, uh, is an important holder of Dickinson items. Um, so, uh, so to, he, all these writings made him America's first celebrity. And they, they celebrated him as the, as the, uh, the Pennsylvania farmer. And, and when I say celebrity, I'm, I'm not, I'm not being, I'm not exaggerating. He, he, he was really America's first celebrity. The, 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 the first maybe transatlantic celebrity was George Whitfield, but Dickinson was the first uh, person in America, um, even before Benjamin Franklin. Benjamin Franklin became a celebrity, but later than Dickinson. But people knew his name um, and they, they, they knew his, his farmer's letters and, uh, and, and his, his uh, so he so he gained this title in the late 19th century, um, penman of the American Revolution. You might have heard that as well. Um, so you know this was a, a I think a well-meaning uh, label, and it, it is accurate in some ways. Uh, his, the writings that he did before independence I think did lead to the American Revolution, but in a way it's really a wrong title because. All of Dickinson's writings before independence were geared towards preserving the relationship with Britain um, and avoiding bloodshed. And so um, I'll explain that a little bit as well. So I don't like this title very much. And, uh, and I, 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 but it's, it's, it's good because it shows him as a patriot and, and to say that he wasn't that, you know, I think people, uh, they mistake him for someone who wasn't as patriotic. That's part of his, that's part of his problem. Um, so, so then uh, you're, you're asking yourself, of course, if Dickinson was so famous, why haven't I heard of, uh, about him? Um, well, okay, so I've been, I sort of puzzled out how to, how to explain this. And the best way is just, it's kind of a chicken and egg situation. You know, basically, Dickinson was misunderstood by America's first historians, and they maligned him. And then, uh, and his papers were also unavailable or inaccessible. And because his papers weren't available or inaccessible, historians misunderstood and maligned him. And, and then therefore no published edition um, was ever done of Dickinson's papers, not for lack of trying. There were about six or maybe seven efforts in 
in the in the in the last 200 years to try to do his writings, but nobody has nobody has been successful until now. And so people can sort of say what they want about him and nobody can really refute them because there are no published editions of his papers. So he is, you know, repeatedly maligned and misunderstood and so on. Um, so I have tried my I've devoted my career to remedying this problem. And uh, David mentioned my, my first book, um, actually 2009, not 2006, but that's okay. Makes me look like I'm more, more precocious than I actually am. Um, so, uh, you know, Quaker Constitutionalism and the Political Thought of John Dickinson. Um, it's the first in a trilogy. And the idea was to explain his uh, decision on independence and also talk about this really significant strand of constitutional thinking in our history um, that was uh, you know, uh, you know, put forth by Quakers. Um, so, so that's the first part. And, and basically what that argues in a nutshell um, is uh, Dickinson was, was um, uh, he grew up around Quakers. His family were Quakers. He, the, 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 the assembly, uh, the provincial assembly in Pennsylvania was mostly Quaker. Um, his whole world was shaped by Quakerism. But Dickinson was not a Quaker. Quakers were pacifists. Dickinson was not. Um, he believed that peaceful protest was peaceful protest was best, but he was not a Quaker. He believed in the lawfulness of defensive war. So if a country is attacked, a people has a right to defend itself. So, um, so that's really important for understanding Dickinson. Um, but Dick, so Dickinson adopted uh, a, a number of Quaker uh, priorities, one of which was um, uh, civil disobedience. And so instead of revolution, Quakers said, we need to protest peacefully and preserve the Constitution. So um, uh, they put forth this, this concept and practice of civil disobedience. And the definition is uh, uh, the nonviolent public breaking of unjust laws with the intent to educate the public about the injustice and return the Constitution to its fundamental principles. So it's a mouthful. But it means, um, you know, not doing any damage to persons or property as you assert your rights. You peacefully break the laws um, and then uh, the government has no um, recourse except to repeal them. Um, so this is what he offered to Americans. Um, it's exactly what Martin Luther King was doing 200 years later. Um, and, uh, and it's no coincidence uh, that, you know, both Dickinson and King were mentored by Quakers that they they came to the they came to the same conclusion and that Quakers helped them understand. Um, so um, so uh, in the HSP collections, while I was working on this monograph, I found what I I refer to as the smoking gun document, and this basically links Dickinson to Quakerism, and and in this very brief document. He, he says, you know, basically that, you know, we need to model our, our behavior on Quakers. You know, they were turbulent, but they were Pacific. And when I found this in the reading room, I literally swooned. I, 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 I just, you know, I had to sort of stop and, and, and collect myself because this was the thing I've been looking for. All my other evidence was circumstantial. And here I found it. And as it turned out, it was two pages um, that were part of a draft of a pamphlet that Dickinson published, simply called To the Public. Um, he published it under the name Pacificus, but nobody had ever found this draft or these two pieces, which actually were excluded from the publication. Uh, and, um, uh, but, but here we are, this, this is what is in, in the HSP collections. Um, so, the other, the, uh, the second part of the trilogy is, as David mentioned, the John Dickinson Writings Project that I established pretty much as I finished the monograph and realized how much material there was on Dickinson and somebody really needed to publish it. And the NEH approached me about doing it, but I really wasn't interested in becoming a documentary editor. But then when I realized that someone needed to do it, I also realized that that somebody was probably me. So um, I've embarked on that. And so I have this, uh, this team of, of scholars and uh, researchers who are helping me and doing, you know, a lot of heavy lifting to, to produce these volumes. 
And um, uh, right now, um, David said, uh, I think 11, but we've gone back and forth. Right now I'm saying 12. Basically, I, I'm trying to wrap this up sooner rather than later so I don't die before it finishes because that's what happens with documentary editors. They, their projects outlive them. And I don't think our funding situation is not such that, that it, this won't continue once I'm no longer here. So we have to finish it. So first two volumes are out. The next one is coming out next year and we hope to have um, a volume published every two years for the next 10 to 12 years. Um, so um, then, then, as David mentioned, the third part is a, a, a biography of Dickinson, which I'm presently in the throes of, um, but using all this material that, that I've been finding and, and then also stuff that won't be published in the, in the Dickinson um, editions. So, um, so in the HSP, the, 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 the major collections that contain Dickinson materials are these. Now there are, I, I, I haven't counted up how many collections contain Dickinson materials, but, but many, many more than this. These are just the biggest collections. So um, the HSP owns more Dickinson manuscripts than any other place. The, a second is, is um, uh, the library company. And in fact, R.R. Um, R. Logan, uh, when he donated his papers to the HSP, he basically took his papers, ripped them in part and gave uh, a part and gave half to the HSP and half to the library company. So you can find portions of drafts of one document in both collections, which is kind of crazy. Um, but so these other other collections have been around for, for longer than that. Um, well, all right. So the problem is that some of these are just, they're, they're too much. Uh, they're, they're, there's too much to manage. And, uh, and there have been these problems with people not knowing about Dickinson. And, and so it makes it, trying to process his collections very, very challenging. This is from the, the Logan Family Papers Finding Aid. Um, the bulk of the papers are assumed to uh, relate to uh, John Dickinson and his practice of law. Um, although Dickinson's name is rarely mentioned in connection to the documents and the handwriting is difficult to positive, positively identify as his. Well, my team and I can identify his, his writings, and we can read it even when it looks like this. Um, and uh, it's some of it's just really a crazy mess, um, but we are, are identifying them and transcribing them and annotating them. And I'll show you some examples as, as we go along. Um, but yeah, it's, it's a little crazy. Um, so um, really there's kind of a cradle to grave um, uh, uh, selection of documents in, in, these, uh, in, in these collections. So starting with the family Bible, his, Dickin, the Dickinson family Bible um, that has you know, his own uh, handwritten notes about his family. So you know, we can start there. And, uh, and then we, we go, um, uh, the, the next big, big fascinating thing is uh, Dickinson's, uh, he, went, he, he went to legal for legal training at the Middle Temple in London. And we have a lot of those materials. One of my favorite things is this item. It's uh, the Doctrina Placitandi, and it's uh, basically a textbook on how to plead the common law that lawyers used in the, in the 1750s um, when they went to London to be trained. And, it, and this was a single volume that was disbound and rebound into three volumes so that law students could write their notes in the blank pages. So, um, and, and you'll notice that it's, it, you probably don't recognize the language. That is law French. It's a weird combination of English, French, and Latin that was used in the courts. Um, uh, and it was being phased out by the time Dickinson uh, was trained but they still needed to, to be able to read it. So it's not just that it was English, Latin, and French all woven together, but there were even, you know, um, there are even characters that don't exist in, in our languages anymore. So it's very difficult to, to read this and to translate it. Um, and, but Dickinson could do this. So, um, so, so, so here was his, his textbook. And this, what's exciting about this is this is the only, I believe, it's the only copy of this book that is both American owned and annotated. We have lots of versions that are annotated by British people, but this is the only one annotated by an American that we have. So we get to see how Dickinson was processing his understanding of the common law. And then in his case notes, 
we see him changing, you know, taking the British common law and changing it for American circumstances, which is very exciting to, uh, uh, to legal historians. Um, we also have at the HSP um, three of the five extant legal notebooks that he that he wrote in. Um, those are those are interesting as well. Um, in law school, this was his goal. This is why Dickinson studied the law. I can find no consideration of equal weight with defending the innocent and redressing the injured. That seems to me the noblest aim of humanity uh, of human abilities and industry. So this was Dickinson's driving motivation for going for studying law for becoming a lawyer and for you know engaging in public service um, he was driven by this and he, he it informed everything he did um, so when he got back to Philadelphia one of the first things he got into and he kind of fell into it was this uh, the trial of William Smith who was the provost of the College of Philadelphia by the Pennsylvania Assembly now this is not as famous as the Zenger trial in New York, but it should be, it should be better known. It, it covered all of these fascinating topics, liberty of the press, freedom of assembly, freedom of speech, privacy, habeas corpus, trial by jury, self-defense, bail, double jeopardy. And Dickinson, who was just this wet behind the ears, you know, fresh out of law school guy, he ended up being the lead attorney arguing on behalf of William Smith in front of the Pennsylvania Assembly. And the papers are, are some of them are at UPenn, some of them are in New York, but the, but the really fascinating stuff is at the HSP. And it's fascinating because nobody knew that Dickinson was a part of it, but he, Dickinson wrote up notes from this trial and he wrote them like, a, like a, almost like a play. So you can see like Mr. Dickinson, Mr. Galloway, and, and he had speakers and he quoted them. And so it, I think he intended to publish this, but he never he never got around to it for some reason. But but now, if all of the papers looked like this, we would be in good shape. But unfortunately, a lot of them look like this. And so we've had to, you know, painstakingly, you know, reconstruct what he was doing and what he was saying and it's just, it's fascinating stuff. So here is what the John Dickinson Writings Project does with that. So it's still, you know, it's still a challenge to read, but it's legible. So now you can see why Dickinson's papers have not been processed, why they have not been published, why they have not even been identified in a lot of cases. Um, um, a, a, another interesting case uh, his notes, and this one is a little bit better known than some of his other cases. This was a case of um, Dominus Rex versus Rachel Francisco, and uh, it was an indictment for murder of a bastard child. And uh, this was a very serious case. This was the death penalty case. And most men, especially up in, you know, rising stars like Dickinson, did not want to take cases that dealt with female issues. And, and but Dickinson, he took this on. And OK, so not only was Rachel Francisco, not only was she a servant, she so she was lowest in the in the hierarchy, You're not a slave, but but close because she was also mixed race. Um, she was black. And and so Dickinson took this case and he argued it for her. And he took her cause and he said, uh, his notes here, you know, women have suffered no doubt for the concealment of a dead child. He, he took pity on her and, and, he, and he made the point to the jury, this is a harsh statute to, 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 to you know, execute a woman for you know, her being in this, this terrible position. And Dickinson said that his sense of honor would not allow him to, um, uh, to defend anyone who was guilty. So, uh, so he took this case and he, he made her a sympathetic, uh, uh, he tried to make her a sympathetic um, uh, uh, defendant. And, and, you know, he pointed out that, that her actions were not done through malice. And, and if there is the least doubt about her guilt, there is a great misfortune in condemning the innocent. So she, you know, he, he, he's really making a strong case for her. Um, unfortunately, uh, she was not acquitted, but uh, the court uh, wanted to take pity on her, and so she got a reprieve. And unfortunately, we don't know what happened to her at the end. But but he he, uh, he made a very good uh, a good case case for her. Um, 
an, another really important document um, is uh, that the HSP owns is the Dickinson's draft of the Articles of Confederation that he wrote just before independence was declared. Now, they weren't going to ask him to, Congress was not going to ask him to write the Declaration of Independence because they knew he was opposed to it, but he, they, but he was trying to do everything, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> everything he could to set America up to succeed. So he drafted the Articles of Confeder Confederation with some very interesting clauses, and I want to talk about uh, two of them in particular. So as you can see from his, the Dominus Rex v. Rachel Francisco, Dickinson had a special interest in, in defending women. And, and he did so also in the Articles of Confederation. So um, here is a draft religious liberty clause. Um, so nobody knew about this before I found it. Um, and, and so what it says here, I'm gonna focus on just this top part. And, and what he does here is he says, um, no person or persons living uh, peaceably under the civil government um, shall be molested or prejudiced. And then here's where it gets interesting. He says his or their, and then he crosses it out and writes his or her persons or estate for his or her religious persuasion. So he here is using gender inclusive language for the first time in an Anglo-American constitution for a, fundal, a fundamental right women's religious liberty, but he didn't stop there. He continued that they should not be, you know, um, uh, molested or prejudiced for uh, his or her persuasion or practice. Now, when he said practice, he was thinking particularly of his Quaker female relatives, his mother, his wife, and all of her female relatives because Quakers were the only religious group to allow women to preach. So here what we have is a, a really a forward-looking clause because Americans didn't start using gender-inclusive language in their constitutions until the 1980s. And, uh, and, and so this anticipates the First Amendment and also the 14th Amendment because it's applied against the individual states and it recognizes women's, um, both their religious liberty and their freedom of public speech. So this is, this is truly revolutionary. Um, another thing connected with women that I just think, I just love this. So I'm just gonna throw it in here. This is one of my favorite discoveries. This little colorful pocket almanac that belonged to Dickinson. In it, he recorded the birth of Debbie Norris to um, uh, uh, Isaac and Mary Norris on the 19th of October, half an hour after 10 at night. So this is Debbie Norris. And she then, in turn, she was a close friend of his throughout her life. And then she, just as Dickinson recorded her birth, she recorded his death in her diary. And uh, I'm not gonna read that, it's a little long. Um, and uh, my screen is covering up uh, the text anyway. So um, in any case, uh, this is this just wonderful, uh, reciprocal relationship of, of Dickinson with this, uh, with this woman. So uh, he was very close with a lot of uh, important women, um, including um, um, uh, Elizabeth Graham Ferguson and uh, Mercy Otis Warren and Catherine McCulley, uh, uh, in addition to his Quaker uh, relatives. Um, so um, another aspect of the Articles of Confederation uh, that's interesting is that Dickinson added a query in there about slavery. Should there not be an article to prevent uh, people? I can't read it because my screen is blocking it. Uh, uh, let's see if I can minimize that. Uh, well, anyway, um, you, you, I hope you can see it. But to prevent those who after uh, who are, are after brought into these colonies from being held in slavery within these colonies. So he queried about slavery, and this is just um, a, a little glimmer of a foreshadowing of what was to come because Dickinson was the only major figure um, to free all of his slaves during his lifetime and then provide reparations. So I found this manumission deed, this, his first manumission deed for his slaves. I found that buried in a bulky folder 
that was labeled miscellaneous. It was packed full of documents labeled miscellaneous. And I found this manumission deed, which is, which is just really striking. It was the first of three he wrote. Here they were manumitted conditionally. And they were, he eventually manumitted all of his slaves. Um, uh, by, by 1786, he had manumitted all of his slaves uh, unconditionally. Um, in 1785, he also wrote uh, two drafts of, of a bill for the gradual abolition of slavery in Delaware. Um, he tried, he put these before the Delaware Assembly and tried to get them passed, but they, they wouldn't pass. And Delaware did not officially recognize uh, uh, the end of slavery until I think it was 1901. So yeah, you know, Dickinson couldn't be blamed for failing. Um, then um, there are all these other documents, just, you know, page after page after page of documents and it wasn't until I sort of got in and started really getting into those documents where I realized, oh, you know, I recognize these. So this, for example, buried in miscellaneous was um, the draft of a pamphlet he wrote on the relation, the foreign relations with France. Um, so, you know, these drafts are, are just sort of in there and, 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 and buried. And look, it's not the fault of anyone who tried to process these before you can't blame anyone for not knowing this stuff. It was, it was practically unknowable. So the people who processed these collections before did the best they could. Um, but, you know, it, still more needs to be done. So I want to make sure that I recognize uh, the two archivists who I've worked most closely with at the HSP, um, Steve Smith and former archivist Sarah Heim, um, with that, they know the collections like nobody else, and they have helped me track down items that I didn't think, I wasn't even sure existed. So the archivists um, are just so, so important, and, 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 you know, HSP needs more Steve Smiths and Sarah Himes. Um, my plea is to support the HSP and and make sure that these incredibly valuable documents will, you know, live on and and will be accessible to more people, you know, beyond what I have done and beyond what I will do. So that's I'll I'll leave it at that. And uh, and I'll I'm I guess I'm 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 more than happy to take questions. I will stop sharing my screen. And if anyone has questions, uh, uh, I think. Uh, Someone else is going to moderate and read the questions to me, I guess. Um, Jamie, Hank, Chris, go ahead. First of all, thank you so much for an incredible talk. And uh, thanks for dedicating your uh, scholarly life to this important work. Um, as you said, others have tried before you and failed. And it's your persistence and commitment that have enabled you to tell this story today. So thank you for that. 